All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name's my name is Tom Schoenborn. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Instructional Technologies. And uh, while I do a little song and dance about the admin behind today's uh, webinar, we will let everybody catch up to us and, and arrive. Uh, today's webinar is scheduled to be about an hour long. Uh, we have uh, allowed ourselves some time for questions at the end. Uh, to ask those questions, uh, if you go to your little Zoom tab, there is a Q&A section and you can uh, ask those questions in there. I will be monitoring those and interrupting where appropriate, but otherwise we'll probably save most of them till the end. We are recording today's webinar, so if you need to hop off to take care of uh, something else, uh, we will be sending out the link to the video afterwards. Uh, with that, I wanna go ahead and uh, begin introducing uh, our webinar and our panelists. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about uh, training is leadership, why bottom line leaders buy into this culture of training. Uh, today our speakers are Laura McMillan and Don Osterberg. I'm gonna introduce Laura. She is our VP of Training Development, and if you've been to any of our webinars before, you have undoubtedly heard her talk before. Uh, she's a seasoned practitioner. She's been doing this for gosh, probably well more than 15 years at this point, but she's got a BS in business management, an MA in instructional system design and adult learning. Uh, more importantly, she's got a class A CDL and she has uh, been very active in the uh, trucking transportation logistics industry for a number of years uh, since she and Don worked together, well, probably prior to this uh, at Schneider National. Uh, she's also, been on the curriculum subcommittee as part of the FMCSA's proposed rule for ELDT for the entry-level driver training. She serves on the Board of Governors for the uh, National Private Truck Council, uh, from whom she also received or earned her certified trucking professional. Um, and she's an award-winning instructional designer recognized by the uh, ATD, and uh, she's a frequent speaker at many trucking and logistics conferences. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for joining us as always. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tom. And I wanna welcome our listeners today. We're really glad that you're taking some time out today and we wanna make it worth your while. So let's move ahead. I would like to in turn introduce Don Osterberg who is joining us today. Uh, Don has uh, 20 years and, and has worked uh, diligently in that time to advance the safety culture within Schneider National. Many of you know, one of the nation's largest truckload carriers and during his tenure at Schneider, he received the Trucking Safety Coalition's first ever Distinguished Safety Leadership Award. Don is also a retired U.S. Army Colonel with numerous and notable achievements in safety results and the execution of innovative solutions that have made him a major influencer in the world of transportation safety. Across the industry, he's been routinely sought out by numerous organizations to share his expertise, including the American Trucking Association, the Transportation Research Board and the National Safety Council, the FMCSA and the U.S. Department of Transportation, where he continues, uh, even as he's retired now, he continues to be actively involved and influencing numerous leaders uh, in guiding strategy and uh, the advancement of safety across the industry. And importantly, Don has recently joined Instructional Technologies as a strategic advisor in our organization to help uh, keep us on the path of safety and focus on um, exceeding our clients' expectations. So welcome, Don. We're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Laura. I'm delighted to be able to join you today. Absolutely. So let's just take a quick look at our agenda then. So we're gonna be talking, first of all, a little context setting to put us on a level set of talking about the high cost of bad training. We're then going to go into uh, some uh, Q&A with Don talking about building a culture of training that leads to impressive safety results. And then we'll be fielding your various questions um, that you may have. So, and Tom has referenced how to ask those questions. So he'll be moderating that, collecting your questions, and then we'll, we'll capture those and be addressing those as we go. So let's talk about the high cost of bad training. So if we continue and go down to uh, an obvious point here is that bad training is expensive. So 
pretty obvious and intuitively obvious. We know that when we, we're not doing things operationally well, it can be very time consuming and also very costly. There's a, a fact that poorly trained drivers do cause more crashes. So there is a direct correlation that an inattention to the training and development of uh, professional drivers does lead to poor and weakening safety results. Um, so another uh, thing we'd like to point out is with all of the different telematics and ELD data and safety instrumentation on trucks nowadays, we have all this data, but knowing that data isn't enough. Knowing that data isn't fixing things. So in fact, that data can possibly make your organization more liable in the event of a crash, not less. So we'd like to point out that, again, without the support of training or different interventions that address um, poor safety data or performance on the part of drivers, that um, that, that actually can increase, increase the organization's liability. We do know that driving distractions is continuing to grow and is in some ways exceeding speed too fast for conditions in terms of the leading root cause of major crashes around the U.S. Uh, uh, as forced by the FMCSA. So uh, I think all of us can relate to that, that driver distractions are all around us. Uh, we experience that ourselves, but we certainly see it with our fellow motorists on the road. And so that, that is leading to an increase in um, uh, crashes. And again, not having the awareness or training with our drivers uh, around the, this important issue uh, can lead to, uh, again, a, a erosion in safety results. And then uh, lastly here, in, in terms of the expense, uh, where we really see it hit the bottom line is when we are, when bad things happen to good fleets and there are crashes involved, that we are seeing uh, a frankly unsustainable growth in nuclear verdicts and liability insurance pr premiums that continue to rise uh, steadily and, and sharply in some markets. So the next slide actually shows a profile of some, uh, some um, uh, high profile sort of incidents. Um, uh, and, and in summary, that before we get to that, well, uh, we'll just stay here. So the nuclear verdicts uh, and skyrocketing insurance costs. So again, we have several fleets, and these are real examples of fleets that are being hit with nuclear verdicts, something that we would not have been seeing about 10 years ago or so. So uh, it, it has sharply increased. And since Don had pulled together uh, and has been watching and tracking on this trend and has been uh, uh, involved in consultation with uh, organizations to help them address this measure, I'd like him to kind of speak to some of the trends and, and driving factors that are leading to, these, leading to these nuclear verdicts. Well, thank you, Laura. There are certainly a lot of different theories and a lot of different variables that influence what's going on. But uh, just to give you a glimpse, I, you can't swing a dead cat at these days uh, without hearing somebody talk about nuclear verdicts. I do a fair amount of uh, speaking at trucking events and it's a topic uh, common to uh, most of the meeting agendas uh, in which I participate. And, and it's for good reason. Uh, going back just a few years, I was invited a couple years ago to serve on a panel. The U.S. Department of Transportation invited me to serve on a panel uh, and the subject or the theme was transportation futures. And they had asked me to serve as a provocateur to think about transportation 40 years out. Uh, I failed miserably uh, as the provocateur to get people to think 40 years out. Most of them couldn't think much beyond next Tuesday. But one of the interesting uh, anecdotes uh, that I would share is that one of my co-panelists that day was the president of one of our states, essentially plaintiffs a bar association or plaintiffs attorneys association. He was asked a question and said, with the caps on medical malpractice, and in many cases, in many states, there's been tort reform uh, that has uh, created caps on punitive damages for medical malpractices out of fear that they were going to lose too many doctors uh, given the risk of malpractice. So the question was, uh, with caps on punitive damages in medical malpractice, where are your best attorneys going? And his answer without a moment's hesitation was to the trucking industry. The trucking industry is the next great frontier for huge punitive damages settlements. And, and we're seeing those now uh, for a host of reasons. So point, I guess one on that is uh, many years ago uh, in my early days in transportation safety, uh, I used to deal with uh, what I would characterize as probably incompetent plaintiff's attorneys or uninformed, it may be a better word, plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, you rarely see that today. Uh, the best attorneys in the nation uh, have moved into this area. They cross-pollinate extremely well. 
uh, and they learn from one another. So if there's any skeletons in your closet in terms of things uh, that you're not doing uh, properly, you know, they will unearth those things. And the environment has changed. Uh, the words, uh, what I'm about to say will sound subtly different, but for years I used to say in post-crash litigation, there were three questions that you needed to be prepared to answer in depositions if you're a safety director or training uh, on safety manager. And it's essentially is, what did you know? When did you know it? And what did you do about it? What has now emerged in post-crash litigation uh, is, uh, what did you know or what could you have known? When did you know it or when could you have known it? And what did you do or what could you have done? And while the addition of the word could seems subtle, the consequences are not. Uh, so there's really two in layman's terms. There's two paths to punitive damages in post-crash litigation. Uh, they have to, one, determine that you're either incompetent to manage the complexity of the business you're in, or that you're indifferent about the safety implications of the decisions you make. And they don't care. They pursue those in the alternative because they don't care which they prove because both will lead to punitive damages. So if you acknowledge your, that you're unaware of what many fleets are doing in the areas of driver training, telematics, uh, safety, proactive safety technologies, and so on. If you say you're not aware of that, you're colored as incompetent. If you say that you're aware of it, but yet you've chosen to do nothing, uh, you're exposed as being indifferent or putting in company profits ahead of safety. So it is a very volatile environment, as, as you certainly know by now. Uh, and it's incumbent on us to do everything that we can do to not only be as safe as we can be to avoid those crashes, but have defensible positions on what we do uh, toward the FMCSA regulation that we all understand is essentially, in paraphrase, the carriers must ensure that their drivers can, by reason of experience, training, or both, safely operate the type of equipment they use. Uh, that's the FMCSA regulation paraphrase, but uh, so we have to critically, and that 391.11b3 uh, is the basis for where you will get attacked by plaintiff's attorneys if your training programs are not robust and professionally presented. That's enough on that, I guess, Laura. Okay, thanks, Ben. So, um, so thanks for covering those driving trends and some of the real uh, issues that, that the companies are, are seeing actually seeing in, uh, in these verdicts. Um, so what we like to say on this slide that crashes aren't the only cost of bad training. Well, there's that, uh, if you can think about an iceberg where you have the visible part of the iceberg above the water, that's the visible cost of the claim payout um, as a verdict awarded. But beneath that waterline, you have a much bigger iceberg of other cost factors that lead to, again, that unsustainable level of claims cost that, in, that are increasingly putting pressure on a organization's company's bottom line. And uh, so a lot of those additional costs that can be correlated to the initial insurance claims would be the higher fuel costs, the equipment wear and tear, higher insurance premiums, the, the workman's comp claims, and then of course a net impact on job satisfaction or driver turnover. So these are all quantifiable and do have some correlation to, to crashes and can take a company quickly from, the, from operating in the black to the red, uh, where they may be having a good year, but you have a few high verdict uh, or high claims cost categories throughout the year, and that, that will take the uh, company upside down uh, fairly quickly. So you ask yourself, how, how well could your organization sustain that? Um, and if your a reaction to that is, hey, it's it, it really isn't, and you may even be experiencing some of this, then, uh, then uh, we're certainly gonna start talking through, well, how can we turn that trend around? How can we start building a safety culture um, that is able to be put up defensively you know, in, in cases to not only be prevention-minded with uh, uh, reducing risks and, and losses overall, but also advances the, the culture in your company. So let's, uh, we want to turn some questions over to Don. I, I'm going to ask uh, Don several questions and we'll, we'll have Don talk through his expertise in uh, uh, building a culture of safety. And so the first question here, Don, if you wouldn't mind uh, addressing this is, you know, in your view, in, in your vision, what is a true safety culture? I mean, so many organizations have 
a uh, plaque on the wall and may have safety as a, a one of the bullets on that plaque that says, hey, we believe in safety or it's one of our value, corporate values. But to you, what is a true safety culture and how do we lead or influence that safety culture? How do we lead by example? It's really uh, the most important question because I believe that uh, we have to first create and lead a true culture of safety. Anything we do programmatically, absent a robust safety culture, will result in disappointing um, results. So uh, the reason that we add the word true in there, and you just said it, uh, in every company that I've uh, visited on motor carriers uh, in the four-year, there's a plaque on the wall that says safety first and always, safety always, safety first, safety 24-7, safety 365. Everybody's got a different speed. In, but they all have it and they all say it. Uh, some of them actually mean it. So the, the, the definition uh, that I use for a culture is a set of shared beliefs. And I think the operative word here is beliefs uh, that per, are pervasive throughout the organization and they guide the company's behaviors and performance. So it's important uh, that we understand that our behaviors follow our beliefs. So if we want to affect uh, meaningful and lasting change, we, we have to address it at the belief level. So a true safety culture really sets the core values for an organization. And I differentiate core values from situational priorities. Situational priorities change based on the situation, hence the, the name. Uh, but core values don't change. So it's incumbent on us to not only espouse the rhetoric uh, of safety uh, first, 20, safety 24-7, but that our espoused values relative to safety match our enacted values. And what happens in, in trucking companies especially is our driver leaders and most importantly our drivers will uh, conduct what I call acid tests of our true priority, our true values, uh, excuse me. Uh, and so they, the basis for the acid test is what do leaders talk about? What do we reward? What do we recognize? Uh, what do we train? Do we make an investment in professional training? Other things, those are all questions that they ask themselves and they will then conclude whether or not safety is a core value, whether you have a true safety culture or whether it's rhetoric. And the, the value of a true safety culture is that it reconciles tension between the competing demands that our leaders and our drivers face every day. Let, we, we would be delusional if we didn't acknowledge the fact that our drivers face competing demands every day between safety, productivity, service, all of those extra other externalities uh, that challenge us from a safety perspective. But if you've created a true culture of safety, anchoring on a core value that safety is the most important thing, uh, we had a credo that I loved for its simplicity, and it was very simply this, nothing we do is worth harming ourselves or others. What we do in the trucking industry is very, very important, but none of that is worth harming ourselves or others. And if you can get people to make that part of their beliefs, uh, when they confront those competing demands, they'll reconcile the tension uh, in the name of safety. And then and only then have you created a real or a true safety culture. And I, I would, uh, I know most of the folks in the audience today are, are safety directors, VPs, managers, training managers. Uh, culture is generally set at the executive level, uh, but you have the ability, and really you have, in my view, an obligation in the role, role that you're in to influence the safety culture and the training culture within your organization to make sure uh, that it's real. Uh, we have a moral obligation to do that for the motor, with the motor public uh, with whom we share our workplace. We also have a financial obligation to the organization to uh, advance that true safety culture. So. In many words, uh, that's uh, how I think about a motor carrier. Good, good. So just a, uh, again, just sort of a reinforcement. So regardless of a, a person's uh, leadership role, whether they're an executive, uh, high level um, leadership role in the organization or middle management position, your experience is that all leaders, that, that you know, that safety culture needs to resonate and cascade from top leadership down and be demonstrated at all levels. Is, is that, you know, what you have found on? Yeah, that's absolutely the case. In order for it to uh, really be shared beliefs, you have to communicate those beliefs in a way that create pictures 
pictures for our people, very vivid images in their mind's eye about what uh, a true safety culture looks like and what safety and training means uh, to that given carrier. So, and that does start at the top, uh, but we can't let ourselves off the hook. Uh, and one of the things that I often uh, recommend to folks uh, is that sometimes you have to pull on the emotional strings of people. And generally speaking, when I talk about decision making, I say that emotions tend to uh, weaken your, uh, your decision making abilities. So there is an exception to that, and that's in the area of safety performance. And when you understand that success and failure is measured by lives lost or lives saved, injuries sustained or injuries prevented, it's a very powerful motivation. Uh, and we can pull on those uh, as safety managers, training managers, we can pull on those threads to make sure that everybody feels the emotion and recognizes that for every time we fail in this industry, a family is devastated emotionally by the loss potentially of a loved one or a serious injury. And that's simply, uh, we have to be better than that. We have to do more. So I think you're, what you said is exactly right. We all have the mantle of leadership when it comes to mm -hmm. creating and leading a true culture of safety and training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about driver training uh, a, a little more uh, in depth here. So, I mean, there's many mechanisms to move and build upon a safety culture, and driver training is one of them. But from your point of view, what role does driver training play in really advancing or demonstrating high standards throughout the company and helping to build the safety culture? What, what's been your experience there? Well, it's a great question, Laura. And, and, and generally speaking, in my experience, uh, exceptional organization, organizations, organizations of excellence uh, have one common theme, and that's that they uh, possess high standards in everything that they do, and they're disciplined uh, in enforcing the high standards. I used to tell people that, uh, that reported to me that I have very high standards. If your standards are as high or higher than mine, we will never have a problem. But when your standards dip below that, uh, then we may uh, have a problem. But as I think about driver training, especially, I, I look at it through the lens of, let's take a look at it through the lens of a new driver uh, that comes to your organization. Uh, mm -hmm. With the exception of the recruiter uh, that they dealt with, uh, that brought them to the organization, the first experience that they will have with your company is a training and onboarding experience. And from that, they will determine whether they've joined an organization that embraces high standards or whether they've joined a low standards organization and people have a desire for the most part for conformity so what, uh, what we want to make sure is that first experience that they have uh, when they do their assessment of our organization they're going to base that on professional training provided uh, with uh, various uh, mechanisms of training but uh, perhaps most importantly uh, the actual instructors or the trainers that they work with. And, and I'll give you an example of, of what I consider high standards. And some of this may seem silly to some, uh, but uh, I visited a carrier a while back uh, as a new group of drivers were coming to the company to begin their training and onboarding. And they arrived uh, on, a, on a small uh, van uh, from a local hotel. And the smoking area uh, right where they entered the building, there was a smoking area and many of the instructors were out uh, smoking there, right? And that's so the, the very first thing that they saw uh, were the instructors out smoking cigarettes. And I recommended to the uh, training director at that time, I, I don't care where you move the smoking area for instructors. And, and while I don't personally smoke, I don't uh, begrudge people who do, but let's not have our instructors, people who are gonna be put up on the mantle of standard bearers for the organization. Uh, in uh, eye shot of new drivers. So that's a, that's a small thing, uh, but we have to keep our aperture open to look for all of those uh, things that people are gonna uh, make part of their assessment of your organization. So uh, training on the front end and the professionalism of the instructors is critically important to start the drivers off on the right foot of knowing that they join an organization of, uh, with high standards and they can expect uh, that it, the expectations of that organization are going to be discipline and things that many professional drivers uh, embrace. So that's just a couple words about standards and the importance thereof. Mm -hmm. It's often said that the during that new hire process that the instructors and trainers at the new hire experience, they're the first impression, as you just noted with a specific example, they're the first impression and they often are the lasting impression 
for those new hires, right? Mm-hmm. Regardless of how else the rest of their experience goes, they, they, they do, people are observant and they do see, you know, how, how people act and how they behave. And that really becomes the, the model that, uh, of what they believe, you know, going forward. So, yeah. You know, to that point, uh, Laura, and you can imagine from an army guy, a uh, retired army guy, uh, any soldier in the army that I ever encountered, if you ask them who their drill sergeant was, they would be yeah. able to give you rank, first name and last name. They knew it, w- it was, it was etched into their memory banks. I saw mm-hmm. the same thing with uh, what we called training engineers, which were our over the road instructors uh, at Schneider. You ask any driver, who was your training engineer when you joined the organization, they can tell you who that person was. Mm-hmm. And it, it does have a, a lasting impression on people uh, that, that we have to be sensitive to and aware of. Right, absolutely. So, uh, so we get past the new hire phase, and people are well in inside of the fleet. Uh, let's let's move on. Here we go. So, um, as we know, drivers uh, become part of the fleet, and training is effective for teaching certain things. But we also know that driver performance issues and behaviors come up uh, that need to be sort of reoriented. So, in your experience, what are the most effective ways to map that driver performance and behaviors to more of a targeted training. So, you know, of course, in new hires, uh, you know, we a lot often, you know, fleets will cover a variety of topics um, for everyone, so everyone's getting all the whole message uh, across the board. But as the organization learns more, ma- more and more, again, with all the data on individual driver performance, there's a need to do that sort of personalized or targeted training. So Don, how have you approached that? What's, uh, what's, uh, how have you guided uh, moving from sort of general training to targeted training? Well, I saw the evolution, and of course, I had the, uh, the, the luxury of being exposed to very high-quality adult learning in the various uh, training schools and experiences that I had in the military. So I, I recognized uh, then and certainly validated in my experience in the trucking industry Uh, that one size doesn't fit all. People come to us with different cognitive abilities, different levels of experience, uh, different learning preferences. Uh, And so in this case, the the, the operative words in the question are the last two in targeted training. So it's uh, in in the military, we used to talk about the importance of training to standards, not to time. But yet it's very easy to create a driver training curriculum that's time-based. We spend two hours on this, half a day on that, so much time on the range, so many days over the road. And we, in many cases, uh, create kind of artificial time-bound wickets uh, that uh, prospective drivers have to pass through. Uh, It's important, I think, at the outset to recognize that uh, if you believe that not one size doesn't fit all, now we have to uh, do a number of things in order to be able to provide the appropriate targeted training. Uh, I call it just time, just in time, just enough training. And I actually think that's a phrase I borrowed from you, Laura, uh, many, many years ago. But uh, we have to be able to assess through a high fidelity uh, qualification road test uh, whether the individual has a skill or knowledge deficiency or not. And then we can spend whatever time is necessary to get that individual driver up to uh, the standard that they need to be up to. So the first thing we have to do is to recognize you know, what, what sensors do we have to observe driver behavior. Some of you undoubtedly have video-based safety technology. Some of you have collision mitigation with autonomous emergency braking that gives you following distance data. Uh, Some of you undoubtedly use critical events like number of hard braking events per month, quarter, uh, whatever time period you look at, roll stability activation. But make sure that you have the sensors that you have available uh, targeted and you have somebody watching those so that you can identify the opportunity to intervene uh, but then one of the one of the things that I've seen uh, over the years is that many carriers don't do a good job of post crash, post incident investigations, and a detailed, robust, multifaceted causal factor analysis of, for example, a crash. And so I'm switching from initial training more into the post incident remediation. Uh, in terms of mapping. Uh, and what I've found is that often, you know, we, we all are familiar undoubtedly with the five why uh, methodology of doing an investigation, really asking the critical critical question of why. So for example, if a driver's involved in a backing accident, a slow maneuver, hit fixed object backing accident, we ask ourselves, why did that happen? The answer may be, well, the driver didn't get out and look. 
uh, like they were trained to do before they tried to back into a tight back. And, and that's one level. But you'd ask yourself, well, why didn't the driver, that's the second why, get out and look? Well, it may be that the driver was rushing, uh, was in a hurry for whatever reason. So then you'd ask, well, why is the driver in a hurry? Well, it may be that the dispatch was too tight. Maybe we accepted a load and dispatched a load with an unreasonable uh, expectation of delivery time and the pressure of the service uh, to deliver. Or perhaps uh, it's tight because the drivers mismanaged their hours of service. So as you go deeper into asking why, it may take you to a very different uh, targeted list of training, education, or, or progressive discipline uh, for that individual driver. And it may take you out of the driver force entirely and give you the opportunity through visibility to work with the dispatchers and those who are matching loads to drivers and other things. So the bottom line is recognize one size doesn't fit all. We have to be able to assess and observe driver behaviors and performance. And then we have to have a conscious way of critically assessing the causal factors and from that map to the training uh, or progressive discipline that would be appropriate to, uh, to improve those behaviors over time. And Don, um, I, I know often when we work with safety leaders, uh, everyone's wearing many hats these days, has a lot of uh, spinning plates, if you will. And so there's, there's some sense of they don't, there may not be time to do that or a know-how. Um, in your experience, uh, once, the, once the, that process is figured out for the five whys and building the discipline you know, across the safety team responsible, or operations team responsible for that conducting that crash anal analysis. What, you know, can you provide some range of how much time would it take? Just so, you know, we understand. Okay, you know, this isn't necessarily hours of time, but it, it's, it's more minutes. But, but uh, in, in your experience, do, do you know what the range of time might be uh, from your own uh, safety team uh, on average? How long they might spend in crash anal analysis to to then point to the targeted training? opportunities? Well, generally it takes, uh, you know, it, it obviously it varies. One of the things it, it, it takes typically a couple of days because one, you have to, uh, first of all, uh, in my observation, and I don't mean for this to sound uh, negative against drivers, but one of the things uh, that I learned over time is that the first report of the crash or the incident that comes from the driver is always wrong. It's just a human nature. We always tend to spin uh, perhaps what may have happened to uh, to reflect uh, less badly against us. So I always viewed the initial report with a bit of a jaundiced eye. Uh, and once the emotions begin to subside, then you can uh, involve the driver leader. Uh, everybody has a different name for what they call the driver leader. Uh, and, and, and the driver in typically a three or four way conversation, making sure safety and training manager are there to really ask the critical questions uh, look at whatever evidence you may have available. And it typically takes a couple of days to do that. And one of the important things is to document, uh, to one, have a post-crash investigation guideline and checklist uh, mm -hmm. with each person in the process knows exactly what they need to do, when they need to do it, uh, how to diagram the crash, even down to that level of detail, and then have the discipline to follow that uh, to make sure that at the end of the day, the training or the progressive discipline that you're going to uh, going to use are appropriate to the situation. So it, the time varies, uh, but typically it takes a few days before you really know what the truth uh, truth it was uh, that perhaps was involved in the crash. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Let's uh, let's move on to the next question here. So, um, so there's na a natural friction between operations and safety uh, when it comes to how much time is spent in training, whether it's a new hire onboarding orientation process, uh, remediation, performance enhancement type training, uh, currency training, and so forth. Um, can you talk to us about the importance of training cycle time, having that operation sensitivity and the concept of training the standards, which you've talked a bit about already, rather than time, uh, and how you've helped influence leaders to, you know, effectively accept a balance there. And that can be very challenging to do. So can you tell us about your experiences there? 
Well, it, it's a, certainly, a, and, and you've talked about the tension that often can exist between operations leadership, sales leadership, perhaps customer service uh, and safety. Safety can be viewed and training is viewed as the impediment uh, to uh, profitability and service and those things. And, and as I look at, at, at cycle time, well, first of all, time is money. Uh, and what the time that it should take or would take uh, to ensure that the individual uh, has by reason of experience training or, or both uh, the ability to safely operate the equipment is whatever amount of time that it requires. But we have to be efficient in doing that. And, and a lot of people misunderstand when I talk about uh, cycle time compression to say, oh, I see, you're, you know, you're trying to crank it out faster, uh, get them generating revenue sooner. Uh, no, it's, it's actually not about doing less training. In many cases, it may be doing more training, but being more planful and efficient in the way that we go about uh, conducting the training that we do, avoiding the arbitrary time-based wickets. We talked about that. That's easy. It's easy to put together a time-based uh, driver training curriculum. It's more difficult to have an individualized, targeted uh, learning plan for each individual driver. But whatever it takes, one of the things that we know in, in the trucking industry is that we pay a lot of money for the recruiting line to ring. We spend a lot of money uh, recruiting and onboarding drivers. The onus is on us to make sure that uh, we take full advantage uh, and, and really use every resource that we have available uh, in order for those drivers to be successful. We'll talk more about that later. But when you think about uh, by being uh, more efficient in the training time, uh, I think about the value of cycle time is if you multiply the number of drivers that you will hire this year by whatever your daily revenue per truck day may be, just say for the sake of discussion, $1,000 per day. So however many drivers you expect to hire this year times $1,000 for every day of cycle time uh, reduction that you can enable, you're increasing your revenue stream for the company by whatever your revenue per truck day is. So it, when you look at that across the the whole of your organization. I know an organization that hired about 10,000 drivers per year. Uh, just think about the multiples of that uh, uh, revenue per truck day. So there's real money that's at stake and we have the obligation to not take the easy path and use time-based training, but to, uh, to truly develop a customized approach to training based on the individual's needs uh, so that we can get them through as quickly as possible yet at the end make sure that they meet all of the quality standards and the expectations that we have of a safe and productive driver. So don't reduce the training time, but be more efficient mm -hmm. in, in how you do the training that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to, uh, to all of your points about efficiency, uh, as I recall too in the years at Schneider, that it's also where we started to look at um, blended learning approaches, basically breaking up a, 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 a total instructor-led focus uh, a, a, and the limited capacity to do that um, and started looking for the efficiency of online training and simulation training to help not just improve effectiveness, but also expand the efficiency of training and therefore be able to, to deliver it more frequently. So. Um, it, you know, that's, that's also probably a, a factor with the training cycle time. Would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. And I think uh, what you're referring to is what we call the integrated learning model. And, and a couple of thoughts on that. One, if you're using an instructor, and I'll just think about it generally, usually with most carriers, their instructors were their best and most productive drivers. That's why they became an instructor, so that they could inculcate the, the balance of the fleet uh, with their knowledge, skill, and abilities. So you're taking a resource off the road uh, that would be generating significant income potentially for the carrier. If you have that instructor standing in front of a classroom of prospective drivers, it's a very, very expensive way to train. So the first question you, in my mind is, you gotta use your instructors where they're most valuable, which is hands-on training in or at the truck or in a simulator. Our integrated learning model, as you recall, was instructor-led training, which is important, especially during those hands-on components, uh, range training and so on, computer-based training, technology-enabled training, whatever you want to call it, online training, uh, never use an instructor if there is an online uh, means of conducting that same training. And then simulation, they happen to be a firm believer in simulation-based training 
I was exposed to high fidelity simulation in the military. I know that it works. The airline industry knows that it works. The trucking industry now knows that it works. Uh, but yet uh, we've been very slow to embrace uh, as an industry uh, simulation-based training or virtual reality or augmented reality training. And I think it becomes especially critical as we think about hiring younger drivers uh, that we embrace uh, technology-enabled training uh, so that we can not only uh, train what, we, what needs to be trained uh, in a customized way, but really use the resources that we dedicate to training as efficiently as we can. Uh, so that integrated learning approach is, in my view, critically important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's take a, we'll sh shift back to new hires here. Uh, so one of the uh, issues with, with entry-level drivers are those, uh, you know, CDL candidates that are joining an organization and that uh, may need to go through substantial finishing training. There, there has been a challenge to sort of control people uh, who get underway, have a CDL license, who get underway with an organization but may quit for various reasons. So what are your thoughts about how can carriers reduce the number of new CDL uh, candidates or trainees slash new hires who quit or are other quote unquote washed out during the finishing training? Well, I tell you, what, what the answer is uh, to do many of the things that we've already talked about, but there's, there's a phenomenon that I observed over the years, and, and I'm not really sure that I yet understand exactly why it existed, but it did, and I knew it was real. And in the mind, and I don't mean to sound a pejorative tone about uh, driving instructors, but they, uh, oftentimes there's a pervasive mentality in the training organization within the motor carrier that when in doubt, wash them out. And it's based on their experience with people. You know, if you're unable to hit these wickets in our time-based program, uh, we kind of know how this movie ends and we're not gonna continue to throw good money after bad. Uh, and it's incumbent on us to, uh, to wash them out of training. And in, in my observation, uh, we tend to wash out a lot of people who could uh, with some better targeted training and focusing on those areas that they may be struggling with we could have saved those uh, prospective drivers. I talked a few minutes ago about the cost associated with recruiting and bringing those drivers to wherever it is that you're training them. So we really have an obligation to, uh, to do what we talked about, is uh, to recognize uh, that they come to us with different learning preferences, different cognitive abilities, different experience. What do they need in order to be a safe and productive driver for you and then tailor the training accordingly? Uh, and make sure that you spend the time that you need to and not lose faith in them too early, which is, uh, is often the tendency. So it's not to say that they're all going to make it because uh, perhaps they won't. Uh, but you got to give them every opportunity to demonstrate that they're capable of learning uh, and mm -hmm. meeting expectations of the organization. And I think it sounds cliche, but targeted training is certainly a means to that end in my experience. So, uh, and to, to add to that, so, so often sometimes a new hire, um, they may have terrific training, but they're not having great experiences with a fleet manager. Uh, you know, the industry talks about driver shortages, but, they, but there is also a parallel sort of shortage of, of uh, experienced fleet managers. So have you been involved? In, and if you have, what, what are thoughts that you have about um, again, improving that driver experience so they're less likely to leave in that sort of vulnerable 90 to 180 day time frame uh, by virtue of just, you know, better handling, you know, better communication between the fleet manager and the driver uh, trainee uh, as they work their way through the finishing training. Do you have any thoughts there? Uh, I absolutely uh... Uh, one of the, the first role that I had at Schneider, I was the vice president and general manager of Schneider Specialized Carriers, and I was talking uh, with uh, one of my driver leaders, we called them, uh, I can't remember the name, the STL was the acronym way back when, and they've since changed that to driver business leader, but he talked about the importance of a new driver and making sure they never hit what he called the terminal anxiety point. And I said, well, what do you mean, terminal anxiety? And so it was that, it's at that point where they're out away from their instructor, perhaps on their first load, they're encountering a situation that they're not familiar with. Uh, and back uh, kind of in my day, and I'm, I guess the elder statesman here is we, you know, we were raised with, uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Oftentimes now it's if at first you don't succeed, quit. 
So you have to want to recognize that some people are just hardwired that way, but you have to provide to the degree that you can a safety net under them to get through that terminal anxiety point. And oftentimes that's not the driver leader. They're intimidated by calling or driver leader and saying, I just don't know how to do what it is that you've just asked me to do. Perhaps they're doing a border crossing in Canada or they're navigating a scale. They may have done it once uh, with their over the road instructor, but now they're on their own. Uh, and uh, the anxiety level starts to go high. Uh, and so what, what I found worked best was uh, I talked about, we called them training engineers, the over the road instructor, instructors with our drivers. We incented them with both the performance of the retention of the drivers that they train. So if that driver confronted a situation that was creating anxiety and they just didn't know how to handle it, uh, and they're not apt to call the driver leader, call the individual who trained you, who was your over the road trainer and say, hey, I, you know, I, I'm encountering this situation. Can you talk me through it? Can you help me through it? Uh, and then uh, you incent those uh, instructors, those over the road instructors, uh, based on the performance of the graduate and the retention. And I just found that they're far more apt to contact someone that they knew and were comfortable with, meaning their over-the-road mm -hmm. instructor, than they would be in calling their driver leader. So it's a, a, an important uh, kind of way around that terminal anxiety that is all too often uh, what we mm -hmm. see in our industry. Mm -hmm. it, we have found uh, with feedback from our clients too that wherever they have required their frontline leaders, uh, driver leaders, um, they have required them to go through some of the training that their drivers can as is practical. So in some cases, it may be online training uh, because that's time efficient for a fleet manager. And the intent, intention of that is to build a knowledge base, but also an appreciation level uh, and therefore an opportunity for a fleet manager, frontline manager to, have, to build that rapport with drivers uh, where it, it, they, they then really can be more of a team, especially if the fleet manager has some appreciation for the training that their drivers are going through. So, so we have some- Well, and I think too, yeah, to that point, I think credibility be, becomes very important and leadership is about influence, the ability, and you have to grant me the ability to influence you. I can't command uh, like, uh, and I really, couldn't even do that in the military. A lot of people think that's the way leadership is in the military and it's really not, but uh, we really can't command our influence on others. They have to allow us influence. And one of the, the foundational prerequisites is uh, having credibility. And I can gain as a driver leader credibility with you when I demonstrate knowledge and a sensitivity uh, with the drivers. Doing ride alongs is another way that they can gain credibility uh, and greater influence with drivers. So you bring up an excellent point and I agree with you completely. Yeah, yeah, that seems to work well for some organizations. So we have been talking a lot about what to train drivers, what are some of the key core topics and curriculum that are important to hit and finishing training and, and some ways about how to train drivers with instructor-led training, demonstrations, hands-on, simulation, online. Uh, what are your insights, Don, on when to train uh, and it may, I think, beneficial to the group to understand how did Schneider used to do uh, the sort of currency training, the biannual, and then how, you know, how did the thinking shift in terms of when was the right time to train drivers? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different threads that you can pull on. Uh, one, when we talked about, and you, what you're referring to is sustainment training. We used to do biannual, uh, twice per year sustainment training. We would put the curriculum together. Uh, we would bring our best drivers off the road and train the trainer so that they could go out to the fleet and train. And, and we could have a driver driving a dedicated fleet in Southern California. And if part of the winter training was mountain driving uh, in a winter environment, they would sit through that training, which is, I, as I reflect back on it now, you know, we were, I think we were, we were very proud of the training we were doing at the time, but we were, we were wasting a lot of driver's time with that approach to training. And so we went to quarterly sustainment training that varied by region, by account, by the type of work that they were in, uh, that morphed into monthly training uh, which uh, is, is still going on today. But even based on what we now know and the data that we have available about driver behavior and the awareness that we have, it's really become providing the driver what they need when they need it. So sustainment training is really an ongoing thing. But the other thread that, that you can pull on when we talk about when training, and I actually kind of stumbled into this almost by, by accident. Uh, we were looking at fatigue, and I would argue that fatigue is arguably the number one cause of, of high severity truck-involved crashes. 
And so I was uh, getting myself up to speed on circadian rhythm, understanding hours of day, time on task, all of those aspects. And I realized the more I learned about that, and I had some very bright people kind of educate me on human performance relative to circadian rhythm. And I, and I said, have we looked at our training curriculum critically such that we are training our most important lessons, those topics that we know correlate to, uh, to safe and productive uh, driver uh, performance at a circadian peak and not during a circadian trough. And, and, you know, people look at me like the ox reading the Bible, but the, the answer was no, we hadn't really looked at it that way. We put together the training curriculum and sometimes it's easier to say, well, today's going to be a classroom day and you're going to sit in the classroom all day or you're going to look at online training all day. And that's tantamount to cruel and unusual punishment. So you have to, to keep people interest, you have to mix the training up with some online or instructor led training, some, uh, simulation training, if you've invested in that, or in uh, at truck range training and those types of things. But looking at circadian rhythm, and one of the things that perhaps you would should think about that you haven't uh, is that one of the times of day the experts taught me that uh, human performance, irrespective of whether they're chronically fatigued or they are well rested, uh, the performance gap is is minimal. And that's uh, right after dinner, typically, from that you know, 5.30 to 8 o'clock kind of time zone. You know, what you might actually find is breaking the day up. Oftentimes, when uh, new drivers come to you for training, they're living out of a suitcase. They're living in a hotel. Uh, you can uh, potentially uh, give them a break midday and bring them back after dinner for some additional training. It's just an idea. But the, the, the concept is, one, mixing your training, but two, looking at your critical lessons and making sure that you schedule those, not right after lunch when people just had the uh, double bacon cheeseburger and they're gonna fall asleep, but when they're most alert, you schedule that most important training. And if you're gonna schedule training during circadian troughs, make sure that it's hands-on training where the driver is perhaps on a range, they're moving around, they're staying engaged and active and not listening to an instructor or watching an online training lesson. So that's what I'm referring to when I talk about when to train. Uh, very good points in terms of time of day is, is a factor as well as far as looking at seasonal training and uh, amping up to a quarterly or monthly basis and again using effective training mechanisms it's, it's more doable than simply you know sort of herding people through on a biannual basis uh, it, it was uh, quite the exercise back in the day when when Schneider did that and I, I know we, we felt it, it definitely had a lift in safety performance, but it certainly was quite a costly exercise to do that. Certainly was. Yeah. Let's uh, then kind of circle back to where we began um, on the next slide here. We uh, uh, want to talk and kind of circle back to where we started with the nuclear verdict um, and the reality of the increase in these. So, Don, in your experience, how can carriers use training and the documentation of training to help reduce the risk of a nuclear verdict in their organization uh, in the post-crash litigation phase? There's a couple of things here to, to think about. First of all, uh, if, if a driver is involved in a negative incident or, God forbid, a crash, uh, Every day that they continue to drive until some effort is made toward remediation that can be documented is a day of risk. So you have to look at uh, when you go through that causal factor analysis and the five why process that I talked about and assign remediation, whether that be a training event or a progressive discipline, uh, the sooner you can do that, the better. So that's one area way of mitigating uh, risk because if the driver, God forbid, is involved in a second incident before you've had a, an opportunity or taken the opportunity for remediation, it's problematic. It's it's more than doubly problematic. Uh, so that's that's one way to look at it. But the other important thing is on documentation. Uh, one of the things that I've found as I've worked with carriers since I retired is that uh, not, not many of them have a robust learning management system. Some may be using an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and oftentimes what happens is, you know, they will, they will say the safety director or training director uh, in a deposition will say, well, generally, usually, almost always, this is what we do. Uh, but in the case of the driver that was involved in this high severity crash, we didn't actually do that. Uh, so training that's not documented did not happen. 
you may know that it happened, but you will never be able to prove uh, in court that it happened. So documenting everything from the qualification road test that was done with the driver before you gave him the set of keys. We did what we call the skill qualification test, which was at the end of training uh, administered by an instructor the individual didn't know to just make doubly sure that the individual uh, displays appropriate knowledge uh, and skill level to safely operate our truck. All of those things become important, but uh, keep in mind, if you don't, and, and I know, uh, Laura, that ITI provides a learning management system, uh, don't mm -hmm. underestimate the importance of that. If, uh, if every training event that uh, you expose a driver to is not documented, uh, mm -hmm. it didn't happen, and you will have a difficult time defending what you didn't do uh, as mm -hmm. it relates to training. So documentation mm -hmm. is critical. Yeah, for the entire history that you've had that driver to. Absolutely. They, yeah, plaintiff's attorneys will comb through all of those historical records and look for any, any holes. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we, uh, we could go on for another hour, John. We're almost on our time here. And uh, we, we, you have so much rich insight into these topics. And we're certainly going to have you back for... Uh, another event where we can talk more in depth and uh, um, pick your brain on some other topics uh, that would be of interest to us all. Uh, so I, what I would like to spend a moment on before we go into some questions from our listeners is just to point out that instructional technologies that we've been helping busy training professionals and safety leaders lead with training since 1995. Our organization has been devoted to advancing uh, motoring safety uh, with professional drivers uh, for many, many years. Uh, we, we don't serve other markets per se. We really focus on the professional driver. Uh, we pride ourselves in offering clients high quality, cost effective online training uh, that covers a variety of different applications, including onboarding and finishing programs. These would be your new hire programs and various finishing programs to fully uh, get your drivers up to speed on your policies and procedures and ensure that they can operate safely and legally. Um, we have, with many clients, been able to deliver better training for less time and money. In fact, even shaving a full day or more off new hire onboarding. As Don had, had discussed before, time is money. And that just means more revenue uh, for your drivers being out on the road sooner and being able to operate safely uh, and fully prepared in that environment. So we have a lot of experience in helping clients create more and more efficiency in their training. We sur have surveyed drivers over the 15 million courses that we've delivered uh, to drivers uh, to date. We've actively surveyed drivers and over 90% of drivers that take our courses would recommend our courses to other drivers, to their peers. In, uh, in our years in this business and in this industry, we've seen a lot. We've seen pr pretty much everything. And whatever challenges you may be facing, there's a pretty good chance we've helped some similar fleets deal with those issues as well. So, you know, help, you can view us as a, as a knowledge base, as a place to come, to field questions, to get ideas. We can share best practices with you and help, help you activate a program that will help turn your organization around and improve. And if you've heard something today that was helpful and you'd like to learn more or get started on reducing crashes and training costs and don't delay it and don't want to delay it, we encourage you to give us a call after the webinar and, and reach out to us and we'd be happy to help you out. So with that, um, now let's see if we have any questions that have been coming in. So Tom, I'm going to turn it back to you and, and let's uh, see what we've got. All right. Uh, thank you guys very much. We appreciate all the insights. Um, I'm going to assume everybody can hear me. Um, so, uh, the first question that we received looks like a little bit of an alumni question. Uh, this says, coming from a working driver that was present when Don received his award from the Truck Safety Coalition, dot, 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 oh. on a driver trainers, you, uh, with driver trainers, you get what you pay for, it says. As an over-the-road driver trainer, I made less than I made as a driver just moving freight. Even working full-time in training, the pay was less than over-the-road. Unless you need the time at home daily, how do you retain good driver trainers? Any thoughts? Yeah, well, it's a great question. It's that balance that you have to, uh, to try to achieve. Now, one of the things that we all know is that for some, and, and the question itself kind of alludes to the fact that there is value to daily time at home. 
and the instructors generally work long hours, but uh, the daily time at home may be important to them. So they'd be perhaps working less hours uh, than they than they were over the road. But my experience, I, I think I agree with the thesis of, uh, of the questioner in this case, is that you do get what you pay for. If you want an instructor bad, you may get a bad instructor. And so if you really want to attract the best and brightest and then to the question, retain them, you have to make sure that the whole of their experience of which compensation you certainly want uh, quality of life uh, and other things and the opportunity to do important work uh, through, viewed through the, uh, the moral lens that I referred to earlier, uh, then you kind of look at, but, but I will tell you that, that uh, our instructors uh, were some of our highest paid uh, employees uh, because we, we wanted to have the very best. We didn't retain them all, but uh, that was always our goal. Laura, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I think uh, um, my experience with the instructors over the years, um, as well as training engineers, is um, that the more we pulled instructors and training engineers into evaluating the training process and providing input for improvements, that was a, a value-added benefit. Uh, instructors, trainers, training en engineers felt like they had a say. Uh, our instructor and training engineer teams also have oftentimes the first look at new technologies or new processes that the company was considering. And so that was a bit of a, uh, a benefit, if you will, in that they were able to, you know, their opinion was valued, certainly their expert ex expertise um, in uh, not only training matters, but also in testing technologies and giving frank feedback to the organization uh, during pilot surveys and, and studies. Um, so those are softer benefits, but um, that does appeal to drivers. And I know it doesn't, it doesn't replace pay and, and money in the pocket, but um, I, I had found that some of these other uh, benefits that were offered up to instructors and training en engineers that were, were exclusive to them uh, helped offset um, or enhance, if you will, the, the time at home uh, factors and, and, and additional bonus pay opportunities and incentive pay. But it, but it, it helped balance out for uh, many instructors the decision to come in house and train. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, the time in uh, Vancouver, Washington right now is 12.03. So we've hit about one hour. Um, with that, uh, I want to thank both of you for taking the time today to uh, talk to everybody, uh, provide uh, some insight and advice uh, with your years of experience. Um, any last uh, comments to wrap up from either of you? Well, this is Don. I just appreciate the opportunity. I know that we have a, a critical a requirement as an industry to do more and be better. Uh, we simply can uh, ill afford to continue the negative trend in truck involved injuries and fatalities that we've seen over the past several years. So uh, you know, we're doing important work uh, when we spend time on safety and training to make sure that we meet that moral obligation that we have uh, as transportation professionals to be as safe as we can be. And I appreciate everyone's kind attention today. Outstanding. Thank you both very much. Um, that will conclude our webinar. If you have any questions and you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, if you have any follow-up questions that you'd like to ask, you can send an email to info at instructiontech.net and I will uh, pass those questions along to Laura and Don. Uh, if you have any questions about um, our products and services, you can always visit us online at instructiontech.net. And with that, we'll thank everybody and have a great safe day.